Hey, let's explore a new chapter. This one is all about helping other people. You know, sometimes it's obvious when people need our help. And the good news is that sometimes we actually do provide that help. But sometimes, no matter how obvious it might be, we often don't help people when help is clearly needed. And of course, that's what's motivated most of the research in this chapter, trying to explain why sometimes we fail to help our fellow man. And really, the answers aren't always so obvious. As you've learned, social psychologists study social situations, and they often find that subtle, non-obvious factors have a huge influence on social behavior. So in this chapter, we're going to learn about some of the factors that influence whether or not we provide help when it's needed. Along the way, we'll discuss a few things. So for example, we'll discuss why do people help? We'll also discuss specifically when are people most likely to provide help. And then also we'll consider some other things like, you know, who is likely to help people and whom are the people who are most likely to receive our help. Let's get started by defining some key terms and by discussing some evolutionary factors that influence why people help others. First of all, when we're discussing helping we're focusing on what social psychologists refer to as pro-social behaviors. And they're simply actions that are intended to benefit other people. So for example, if I give you $5 to buy lunch, that's a pro-social behavior. Keep this in mind. Our motives for helping people are multiply determined. And that simply means there are many reasons for them. But for now, we're gonna focus on reasons that make sense from an evolutionary perspective because evolution can at least partially explain why we help other people. First, let's talk just a little bit about evolution, because this is important. It's important that we understand the basic point. It's true that evolution is about survival of the fittest, but that doesn't necessarily mean survival favors the biggest or the strongest or the fiercest people and animals. Really, instead, evolutionary perspective emphasizes survival of the fittest individual's genes. That's an important detail. In other words, evolution favors those fittest to reproduce. And that doesn't necessarily mean the people and the animals that are the biggest and the strongest. So look at the guy on the left. He's big, he's strong, he's tough, and he can probably kick the butt of the guy on the right. But the guy on the right might be smart and funny and kind, and his nerdy charm might be irresistible to this girl. And I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. Between these two guys, it might be the friendly guy to the right who gets a chance to pass on his genes. Well, maybe some of our ancestors were relatively helpful people. And maybe those who helped others and received help themselves survived and thrived and ultimately passed on their behavioral tendencies to us. So when we discuss evolutionary factors that influence helping, we're ultimately talking about biologically based behavioral tendencies that we've inherited from our ancestors. Let's talk a little bit more about these evolutionary factors. So we need to ask ourselves, how has it been beneficial for human beings to be helpful? You know, in other words, what evidence supports an evolutionary perspective that at least partially explains pro-social behavior? Some evidence comes from what we call reciprocal benefit or reciprocal altruism. It's based on the idea that although helping other people comes at a cost, we gain because when we help others, we're likely to get help in return. So really, it's based on the norm of reciprocity. You know, if I help you, you're somewhat obligated to help me in return. For example, you can see reciprocal altruism in the animal world, and then also really in the human world via mutual grooming, there's really no risk or cost in these situations other than our time involved. But if I braid your hair, you'll probably braid mine. And then we'll not only have pretty hair, but we'll have some social bond as well. Sometimes the stakes are higher and the costs are really very steep. So for example, as you probably know, after America was attacked on September 11th, other NATO countries came to our defense. And in the military actions that followed, many soldiers from other countries lost their lives. So they made the ultimate sacrifice. Why, you have to ask yourself, why are other countries fighting our wars? And that's because they expect us to fight for them when they're in trouble. So you can probably see how this strategy can increase our overall chances for survival. 
like I mentioned before, this cooperative tendency may have been passed to us via our ancestors' genes. More evidence in support of an evolutionary explanation comes from findings that observers are more likely to reward those who have helped others. This is known as indirect reciprocity. I'm sure you've heard of some recent newsworthy examples. And here's one that I remember. The woman on the left, her name is Ebony Harris. She's a Walmart employee. And she became relatively well known uh, during this time because she took her break time to paint the nails of the woman on the right. She was turned away from a local salon because her cerebral palsy caused her to shake too much. And the video went viral. And then Miss Harris was offered various job opportunities and people who had nothing to do with the situation were even donating to her GoFundMe account that was set up in her name. More evidence comes from in-group favoritism, which is really just a tendency in which we discriminate in favor of our own in-groups over other out-groups. And that makes sense from an evolutionary perspective because our success is really somewhat dependent upon our group success. You know, it's beneficial and adaptive to help group members because by helping group members, we, I mean, at least indirectly, can help ourselves. Here's some additional evidence. Kin selection. You know, because we don't just favor our own in-group. We favor our genetic relatives really the most because when we help them survive, we help our own genetic heritage survive because, of course, you know, we have shared genes with our genetic relatives. But it's kind of interesting because not all of our relatives get the same special treatment. We're more likely to put our lives on the line for like our kids and our siblings compared to our parents. And that really suggests, this is kind of neat, that we look forward toward the future, understanding that our genes are going to be passed on through future generations, through our kids and our siblings, but not through our parents and like our aunts and our uncles. And that's at least one reason why we're more likely to put our lives on the line for our kids as opposed to our parents, our aunts, and our uncles. You know, but let's be fair and realize that we're dealing just with general trends here. Kin selection doesn't manifest itself, you know, in every single situation. And it is true that stepchildren often find themselves on the losing end of this equation. But many step parents treat their stepchildren as they would their own biological children. I know I try to do that. And I tell you, I'd be willing to step in front of a bullet for my granddaughter, yet we have absolutely no shared genetics at all. And, and don't even get me started on the whole domestic violence thing. Remember, we have to be fair about all these things that we talk about. Although we are indeed more likely to help our direct relatives, there's a lot of violence that we direct toward them as well, unfortunately. Well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.